Hello, fellow Rosarians. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am super excited to have Jason here from Fraser Rose Farm. And I asked for questions on my YouTube and within my social media. Today, we are talking about propagation, which is a topic that really excites me. We all want to know how to propagate. And if you're like me, you're not very successful. And Jason is very successful. So I thought, who better to help us than Jason? So Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to share with everybody um, that may not be familiar with your channel about your propagation at the farm? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been running Fraser Valley Rose Farm here, uh, the, the farm itself. I do the YouTube channel as well, but I'm running the farm for about 10 years. Before that, I was in school for uh, horticulture at Kwantlen Polytechnic University for, for horticulture. Um, so I learned that. I went to work for a wholesale grower, and uh, I've been their head grower for a number of years. So uh, one of the jobs that I have to do is I have to multiply, propagate uh, millions of perennials per year. Uh, for the local market and for wholesale across Western Canada, Western United States. I've both been involved in the in the propagation end, but more importantly, I've gotten to work with some really, really talented propagators. There's a 65-year-old Indo-Canadian lady who works for me at my employer who is a better propagator than I can ever hope to be. Uh, so I've, I've been picking her brain constantly about how to do this. So um, here on the farm, I started out doing about uh, 500 to 1,000 roses a year mostly in the semi-hardwood cutting method. And this year I've tried to push it up. We're trying to go for about 3000 roses out of personal propagation. That is just outstanding. I can't even imagine. I kill <laughs> the dozen or so that I try to propagate. So keeping several thousand alive is just inspiring. And I'm so glad that you're, you're here to help us. When I stumbled across your channel, um, months ago, I my, the first video that I saw, it was Roses Are in Trouble, and I'll link that here for everybody to see. I really want everybody to take an opportunity. I, there's a couple of videos I want you to watch, but this is definitely a big one. And what I found so encouraging about you, Jason, is that you're different than any other vendor that we're going to talk to because it feels like that information is so close hold of I don't want them to know how to propagate because I want to be able to sell the roses. And it was just so refreshing to have somebody say, I think everybody needs to learn how to propagate. And it's really going to help the industry if you keep some of these older roses in production or in your gardens, they're wonderful. Thanks for saying that. I, I, I don't think that there's I mean, any chance that I could be the sole rose supplier for North America. I think that would be, that sounds hellish to me. Uh, so I, I think I think I'd like to have a lot of help repopulating some of these older varieties, and so uh, sharing that information is just like, you know, thanks thanks for the opportunity. You have fifty videos out there right now. I think on propagation alone, and so I have tried to dig into as many of those as I can to figure out what in the world I'm doing wrong. So I want to frame the parameters of this for my newbies that are watching this. This is not going to be a video on step-by-step. -step. I'll do that later in the week after I figure out what I'm doing wrong, and I'll show you what we're gonna to try to fix, or Jason's gonna help us fix. This is more of a 201 video versus a 101. This is going to be for people that have tried to propagate or they have done a little bit of the research so that they understand the terminology. But for my newbies, if you'll just kind of hang out and watch and pick up what you can and we'll circle back in the next video. So we think about the other um, assumptions. This is going to be a home grower uh, discussion versus commercial. I want you to figure out how to do this at your house and uh, it'll be focused on semi hardwood cuttings that we're gonna do indoors. So let's dig into this. And oh, the other videos that I wanna pop up here for you guys that Jason has put together, please dig into these videos. He's got two of them that are complete videos on propagation and they have been so helpful for me to understand you know, what he's doing, especially that hardwood cutting, what it should look like. Um, so Jason, let's talk about just real quickly, you did a video on, am I legally allowed to take a propagation? Your viewers are probably familiar with the site, Help Me Find. And if you go and look up a rose on Help Me Find, I'm going to focus on roses for this video. If you look up a rose, it's going to tell you the release date. 
if that release date is over 20 years ago, then you are fine to propagate that rose. You have legal right to propagate that rose. As a home grower point of view, um, you know, the question of whether you have the legal right to propagate or not, we're not talking about commercial growing here. We're not talking about you getting into the business and selling it. So there's some chance that you could get away, you know, there's no propagation police. You could get away with propagating something under the 20, under the 20 years. But the issue of being allowed to, like, you know, legally justified is 20 years. I, I chuckle because I am reminded of a spirited conversation I saw one time on social media and, and somebody was like, you know, I'm telling or I'm calling the police. And it was just funny. So I, 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 think, right. I think of what that, that cop car is going to come up. It's going to have like a green siren on the top and it's going to like, you know, <laughs> they're going to raid your house and look for your yeah, property. Exactly. And it, it isn't going to happen. And for, for home growers, it's, it's generally not a concern, but I think it's probably more the ethical concern. Like, you know, do I have the right to take a copy of this music or this movie? Um, you want to pay tribute to the degree you can from an ethical point of view to those who have put work into uh, breeding these roses and bringing them to market. And so 20 years after intro date is, is what you're looking for. Another funny thing that I saw one time and they, they put a picture and I'm like, oh no, I can't believe it. My rose accidentally snapped and it fell into some rooting hormone and I'm so scared that I propagated this rose. <laughs> Oh no. Yeah, oh no. So those kinds of things make me laugh. But I do have one question though about helpmefind.com. Um, after your video, I went and looked. I pulled up a rose that I was interested in, and it appeared that there had been patents that had been pulled in three separate countries, like United States and Canada and somewhere else, and they all had different dates. And so let's say that I'm looking at a particular rose. Do I need to say I'm in the United States? So I only need to look at the patent date. 20 years from whatever was in the US or no, it's whatever the most recent hold and it doesn't matter where in the world it was. Yeah, that's that's a tough question and beyond my, beyond my knowledge really. I assume North American patent date because there are treaties that control uh, these things or, or, or get these between Canada and the United States. So I assume North American patent date is the one that I pay attention to. Oftentimes those are within two to three years of each other, but it, you know, in the instance that you're talking about, if they patented something in, in North America or in the US, uh, you know, 18 years ago, and then you see that it wasn't introduced in Australia until last year, uh, you know, there's like an 18 year difference there. I would, yeah. I would go on the US patent date. So we're going to focus the conversation on somebody who's just taking a cutting from their great grandmother's rose that they want to have back in their garden. Some people have a magic touch and they're able to take a cutting pop it in the ground and not look at it for a year and voila, it is a full rose. So that's not me and that's not a lot of my, <laughs> my people that I talk to. So I think that we're gonna be able to flush through a lot of this as we start even looking at the supplies, Jason, but we know that roses, different varieties root easier. Is there anything that you can tell us from your experience for, if you're looking for something easy, what we should uh, look for? Sure. Uh, have you got Bonica in your garden? Bonica, uh, no. Okay. Uh, it, it, you can't use the name, but it's over 20 years. Uh, it, Bonica is a is a is a patented name, I think, or a trademark name. Uh, but I'll use it in this conversation anyway. Um, but uh, it it roots extremely easily. Uh, another one, if you have the climber or or Dorothy Perkins or Super Dorothy. That's another one where like if you stick it in the ground, it's it's rooted. Uh, you really can't you can't fail. And it's kind of nice to have those ones around there that are just like, man, every time uh, there's a there's a hybrid musk called Robin Hood that uh, that roots very easily. In fact, I'm going to say as a group, the hybrid musks are a really good way to get your get your feet to wet or dip so, your foot into the pool. Yes, dip your feet into the into the pool. Uh, yeah, you, get get some easy ones. Get some get some wins under your belt because the thing is, roses like all the different varieties of roses are actually more difficult than a lot of other plants. And I'm not gonna I'm not trying to discourage anybody. I'm just saying it takes a little bit of a touch. So if you can find get that touch on the on the uh, easy varieties, then I would definitely say go for that. Is the technique the same, no matter what rose you're propagating, whatever technique works for you, um, you're not going to do something different for an old rose versus a ground cover? Uh, no, it's not exactly true. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief on this, but I did a video um, 
a, just just a couple weeks back called six six methods for propagating roses and some of those methods are more suitable for the old garden roses than for others if you're trying to do something like a gallica and gallicas sucker profusely in the garden uh, dig the suckers it's easier they're not actually very easy to root from cuttings and so you say, well, I want to practice my, my hardwood cutting or semi-hardwood cutting method on Gallicas. You can go through a lot of cuttings and not have very good success. But if you change your method over to just digging up the suckers, that's the way to go, is move to the method that's most suitable. Now, for 90% of other roses, the semi-hardwood cutting method is the one that I would recommend. Uh, that's off of this year's growth. You're not looking at old growth on the, on, the, on the plant, the stuff that overwintered, you're looking at new fresh growth, but you're usually taking it around the time that, the, uh, that it's budding or flowering, and you're going back a little bit on the stem until you feel that uh, semi-firmness to the wood. That's usually the best method. Now, the way it will vary between different roses, maybe the length and the size of that cutting, because some roses have a very, very long internode, that is the space between one set of leaves and then the next set of leaves and the next set of leaves. If you do that on something like uh, David Austin's Buttercup, I mean, it, you're gonna end up with you know, a 12, 12 inch long you know, cutting, it's like, it's, it's huge. Uh, but you go to something like Ferdy, which is a, a, a shrub rose, if you only put three nodes on there, it's only gonna be like this long, you know, like a, a couple inches. So. I, in terms of inches or size of cutting, my kind of optimal size, maybe a little bit smaller than what other people recommend. I, I kind of like something that's sort of in that uh, four to five inch range. That's, that's kind of where I like to end up. And width, they say width of a pencil, I like to be somewhat less than that. All right, so let's talk through the uh, supply list. Of course, we're gonna have printers, alcohol for cleaning, everything. Let's talk about that potting medium. Uh, some people fuss over this endlessly and, and uh, I like to make it very, very easy and just get something that's commercially made mix. Uh, something like Pro Mix or Sunshine Mix, those are both peat and perlite mixes uh, that are made for propagation. I think it might be HP, high porosity, uh, has a, a little more uh, and larger chunks of uh, perlite in it. Uh, and uh, I think on Sunshine Mix, I think it might be a Sunshine Mix number four that you're using. I don't know if these brands line up with what you're doing in each locale, uh, but if you, if you find a, a, one of those veiled bags of, uh, of peat and perlite mixed together with just a little bit of, uh, they usually have a little bit of uh, wetting agent in there and a little bit of lime in there just to even up the, the, the product. And, and, that's, uh, and you're not looking for something with any fertilizer in it. So if you, some of those mixes do have a base level of fertilizer in it, and you, you'd be better off without that in general. And so are you doing a 50-50? If I have to mix this myself, the uh, peat and the perlite, is it just 50-50? Yeah. Might, might be more like 60-40, 70-30 uh, peat to perlite. Okay. All right. Um, always use hormone or can you root without it? You can root without it. You're slower to root without it. Sometimes the difference between... Uh, fast and slow is also the difference between succeed or not succeed, if you see what I mean. It's a race. Your, your, your rose only has, or your, your cutting only has a certain amount of energy in it, and it's going to spend that energy doing something. Uh, you cut it off from its supply of moisture, you cut it off from its supply of nutrients, it has a certain amount of uh, sugar that's stored in that tissue, and it's going to spend it on something. If it spends it on on uh, leaves, if it, if, if it shoots and leaves, and you see that wonderful top growth, and then you pull it out and there's nothing at the bottom, uh, it has, then it has spent its energy and it can't get it back. So you, you probably will fail. I'm not saying give up. I'm just saying, usually you want roots to happen first, then shoots to happen afterwards. And to make that happen or to encourage that to happen, adding the appropriate rate of rooting hormone, which is a fairly low rate of rooting hormone, uh, can help you to do that. Well, and so are rooting hormones all the same? If I'm using Clonex or Harmonex, uh, whatever I can find, are they all the same? Well, pretty much the active ingredient is. The active ingredient in most cases is IBA um, and IBA in different concentrations. So IBA at 0.1% is typically what you'll find in some of those gel solutions. Uh, they use that for cannabis propagation, actually, is, is pretty common up here. Uh, and they'll dip that and it's 0.1%. Uh, 
Uh, the one you would like to use for roses in general at semi-hardwood stage is uh, at the 0.3 or 0.4 percent IBA. And then they have a third type usually or several other types that have higher concentrations. And I stick away from the higher concentrations because what they will encourage is very fast callusing, but they may have a hard time moving past the callusing stage into rooting. So you just want enough to get to callus and then get to rooting. Uh, so 0.1 or 0.3, 0.4, those ones are okay. Anything higher than that, I find that it hangs up in the callus stage. So the other thing that I'm doing that might be causing a problem is misting in addition to a dome. And I'm using Clonex Hormone Mist. Should I okay. be misting with just water? I mean, I can't, I can't rule out that something that you experiment with could work. Um, but I think you deliver the hormone once and at the right, uh, right appropriate dose, and then you move on and forget about the hormone uh, is my, my sort of feeling. Um, in terms of the soil, I, I think there's a lot to be said, although it, it, it's not very specific about soil moisture, mist, and humidity around the plants, because when you see them rot and you see them rot from the base, that's usually to do with excess moisture at the base of the plant or the soil is too wet. Um, so you want to have soil that when you're, when you're first putting it in, you want to have soil that is damp, but not soaking wet. Like if you squeezed it, you shouldn't be able to squeeze it like a sponge and get water to come out of your soil. And then when you stick it, you stick your plant in there. And in terms of uh, how deep you stick the base of your cutting into that soil, I don't go terribly deep. My feeling is that if I stick it right down to the bottom of the pot, uh, I'm not going to have, it's going to expose all of that tissue of the, of the cutting to that moisture. And it just increases the chance that it could start to rot from somewhere. So I just stick it in enough to support the base of the plant. And then I put it under the humidity dome. And usually if I put it in the humidity dome, even without misting the plant for the first time, just put it in the humidity dome the first time with a damp soil, uh, if I have temperatures that are in the right range, I may see some, and, and the dome is closed, I may see some, some condensation on the inside of that dome straight away. And I feel like that, that's probably about the right thing to have seen. Do you care what kind of pot we're using? What kind of vessel for our soil? I'm using cloth little grow pots, but I could also use a four by four. The thing I know about the grow bags and the, the fabric ones is that they force your soil to dry out prematurely. And so you're probably compensating by adding a lot of moisture to that, to that soil, where if you had a plastic pot uh, and you started with a soil that was just damp, it might stay in the right stage for longer. And you may not have to manage your soil moisture quite so frequently. And I think adding moisture to that soil is a dangerous, is a dangerous game because you, you could always, you can always go too far on the moist side. Uh, I saw a video recently talking about why rootings fail. And he talked about using a fungicide where when you, if you are continually having a problem with rooting, they, uh, he says that if you try to spray a fungicide, as soon as you put this rooting into the soil, spray a fungicide and then spray the soil, allow the water to go through, that that might help with any kind of issues from that black rot. Do you have any feelings about that? I haven't played a lot around with fungicides. Uh, and I think um, it kind of goes along with that thing of people are reluctant to use chemicals and I'm reluctant to use chemicals. You know, I, I think if I can get good results without using them, I'd rather, I'd rather go that route. And uh, I've had ever seen people say that honey and cinnamon and some of those natural solutions will work to prevent rot. Nothing prevents rot better, in my opinion, than having a uh, clean-ish soil. When I say clean, I mean not a not a garden soil, you're talking about a potting soil. If you start with a clean soil, you start with a clean cutting and you keep it the right moisture, uh, I've had good success rate. And on an easy to root variety, that success rate might be nearly 100%. So at that point, it's hard for me to, to, to say, well, I should have added a fungicide, right? On some of those varieties that are harder to root, um, you could second guess yourself afterwards and say, well, if I used a fungicide, maybe I would have been successful, but uh, it, you know, I think it's far more varietal and far more environmental than whether you use a fungicide or not. Uh, that's been my impression. Let's talk about, we've talked about a dome, soda bottle, something that's going to capture that humidity. Our dome 
should make it so that we never have to add water to the soil. Is that correct? I'm not going to say never. Uh, if if you're using bottom heat, if you're using bottom heat, um, you're going to see a lot of the humidity coming from that soil is going to raise up into your container very quickly, and you'll get you'll you'll definitely get that condensation on the inside of the thing. But what it will also do, because you have a little hole there for the moisture to escape, is it will start to dry out the soil. Um, so you may have to revisit that and do a misting directly to the plants and directly to the surface of the soil just to maintain it at your sweet spot where you've determined there's enough moisture in that soil. It's not a set and forget it kind of thing. Um, you still want to be back at those plants every day, every second day. I usually can get by leaving it three days before I check my plants. Uh, but if I have them on a heating mat, uh, you know, every every second day is is really where I go with it. And I, I open up those domes. I check to see if it has a ton of excess condensation on the inside of that dome. And like, it's just like it's wet, wet, wet in there. I'll take the inside of that dome and I'll shake it off. I'll get all that moisture out of the inside of that dome. So it's not leaking against the bottom of the container and leaving lots of moisture in there. I'll look at the surface of the soil. If it looks like it's lightening up in terms of color or starting to look a little bit dry, then I pull out the mister and I will mist the tops of the pots and the plants to just get some moisture back into that top layer of the soil. Leaving the plants themselves with sitting moisture on the leaves is not desirable. It's not, ah. it's not the best thing. Oops. Right. <laughs> Right, so it's you'd you'd rather have the moisture, the humidity within that container, sustaining them so that they're not losing moisture, but they're not sitting there wet. Because if they're sitting there wet, that's just a spot where the spore of a fungus could could germinate and then kill the plant. If I do miss the tops of the plant in the soil, typically, and I'm just talking about my routine here, I'll leave it open again for the next half hour because I've re I've reintroduced re some soil to the top of the, of the pots. I'll leave it for a half hour. I'll come back there. I'll give it a, a little bounce to drop the droplets of moisture off of the roses. And then I'll put that uh, humidity dome back on. If you have um, just saying about that humidity that condenses in, in, inside the dome, it, it should be a light condensation. Uh, and I know this, I'm, I'm, without showing you examples, that might be harder to say. But if you find that the water is like, thick and rolling down the sides of that humidity dome that's, yeah. that's probably too much that's probably too much i would take the dome off of that i would shake it off to get rid of some of that excess condensation then i would put it back on and then see how it comes back next time now let's say it's the other way and it's not too wet in there or i haven't lost moisture in the top of the plant so i open it up and the humidity dome itself has no condensation on the inside of it the plants are in good condition, like turgid, like they're, they're, they've got, like their leaves are, are holding moisture. Uh, the soil moisture is fine, but I think it might be a little bit light of moisture overall. Then what I'll do is I'll take the, the misting bottle and I'll mist the inside of the dome only and not the plants. And then I'll give it a little shake and I'll put it back on. When I open that, the second thing I'm looking for is I'm looking for what's happening to the plants, right? So I'm looking to see, are they still holding their leaves or are they dropping their leaves? Uh, and how quickly are they doing that? If they drop their leaves super, super quickly, that can be a sign of stress or that you've got the right the wrong temperature or something has gone, has, has freaked those plants out. Uh, ideally, once you've stuck those cuttings and you put them under the humidity dome, you come back in, in two days, four days, six days, two weeks down the road, and you're not seeing massive uh, immediate leaf drop. That immediate leaf drop is is literally a bad sign. Doesn't mean you're going to fail. Doesn't mean you, you can't succeed. I always lose mine. <laughs> mine always drop. Right. Well, it doesn't mean you're going to fail. Uh, but if you if you hit the exact right sweet spot of you know bottom heat, uh, humidity, uh, soil moisture that the, that the plants were not stressed when they went in there. Your very best case scenario is that a week later you open that dome and they're still holding their leaves and, and doing fairly well. Now, two weeks, two and a half weeks down the road, I would expect, in almost all cases, I would expect some leaf drop. I would expect it to be dropping leaves and, and you know, I mean, you, you did something severe to these plants or these pieces of plants, you cut off the root system. Uh, they're going to react to that, right? So um, at that point, if they're dropping leaves down in between the cuttings, then I would fish those out and get them out of the way because you don't want to leave them sitting there rotting at the base of your plants. If you see any stems, of course, that have started to turn black from the base, uh, even a hint of black, if you just catch a little, a little corner of black as you're looking at it, 
pull it, get it out of there. Okay. And so if they turn yellow, um, I've been using your tip that you provided where you put a sheet of paper over to kind of shield the light. Does yellow indicate that they have too much light? Uh, yellow indicates that the plant has given up that leaf and it's stressed out and, okay. and it's going to, and it's going to, and it's going to in an orderly fashion, pull the nutrients from that leaf and then drop it. It's, it's made a decision to drop that leaf. Most of the time that that ha that I see that happen directly after a cutting, uh, it's going to be because either the temperature levels are too high or the light levels are too high or something is freaking it out. Um, so those are the first two things I would look at some varieties uh are 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 more have more of that tendency than others and so if you're doing a rugosa rose uh what i found is that they really 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 want to see a drop in their light levels like a lower light levels than i offer to everything else um and actually reduce the surface volume of their leaves quite a lot when you place them in if you place them under high temperatures and high light levels uh directly after cutting they will all turn brown and I'll turn brown and they'll fail on you quite quickly. How much light do we need? And are T5s adequate? T5s are fine, yeah. Um, also the the uh, the pre-built replacements in LED for the T5s, the same size and shape, it goes into the same fixture. Those are great too and very efficient. Uh, the question of how much, well, I guess it depends on your ambient light in your room. Uh, so you, I noticed when I saw a video of your area, you've got a couple of a couple of little windows sort of to the side and behind what you're growing with, uh, which isn't providing a whole ton of direct light. So you're pretty much relying directly only on your on your uh, artificial light. Uh, probably, and I'm going to be honest here, I don't measure. I've been measuring my light levels uh, around the plants. I just I kind of know when enough is enough. Uh, which is not very helpful, uh, you know, in, a, in an environment like this. So what I probably will do in the next little while is I'll either get an app for my phone that measures light levels and, uh, and take a couple measurements in places where I've been successful. And I'll share that information uh, either through my channel or back through you just to say, look, if you, if you measured it through this app, this is the kind of light range you're looking for. That's uh, that's been useful. That's been successful for me. Are you keeping them on for twelve hours? What timer should we have? How long? I get natural light in my in my environment. You have to factor that in. Uh, middle of the day, I don't offer light to my plants. So somewhere between eleven a.m. and say five p.m., they're getting sufficient natural light to keep them in the game. And so I give them a boost in the morning. I go from seven seven in the morning to set to eleven, and then I, you know, in the afternoon I start up again at like four or five, and I go until about uh, nine at night. So they're in all told they're getting about fourteen hours. Um, and roses are not, unlike other plants, they're not day length sensitive. They don't they don't they don't change their physiology based on day length. So you can offer them a whole ton of energy, longer days if you want to, uh, if that works for you. But I think you know 12 to 14 hours is 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 fine. And I, I would imagine some people will say more is better, and they'll go for an 18 hour day or they'll go for a 24 hour day. And I have nothing to think that that wouldn't work. But I did have a question from one of my rosarians that I think you've answered that the length of the day doesn't matter. So if they were using a natural window and it was winter and shorter days, will it take longer to propagate? I think is their question. Well, um, yeah. I and you know, it's, it's about what, what uh, energy you are delivering to the rose. Now, give, granted the fact that you've removed all their leaves or that uh, what leaves remain are of limited effectiveness, they're not photosynthesizing the way that the roses do in the field. They're more or less relying on the stored energy inside the stem. Uh, but the light does offer some amount of photosynthesis. And what it also does is it offers, as those photosynthates are created in the leaves and in, even in the, on the stem, wherever the plant is green, it starts sending those downwards and it sends them downwards with a rooting signal. It sends it downwards with rooting hormone. That's what you're trying to replace by putting the rooting hormone into the plant. So you, you're actually trying to shortcut that, that step, but it's doing two things. It's adding energy and it's adding plant growth regulator, uh, the auxin to start making the roots. Once they've started rooting and so I'm now skipping ahead to a later stage. They've started to root and you want to give them a boost, right? And they've started to throw new leaves. I've got, a, I've got some examples here. Hang on. Here's a pot here that I rooted uh, this year. And this is the stage after they've rooted is they start to throw these fresh new shoots up here. And if you get to that stage there 
and you gave them some extra light, uh, some extra light and some better conditions, uh, then you could probably speed along their development. The other thing you should be doing as soon as you see that they're firmly rooted, or at least, you know, uh, developing a good set of roots, and they're starting to send new shoots is you want to get them out of that humidity. You want to actually remove them from the humidity domes and get them sort of living on their own roots and pulling up their own nutrients and, and doing all of that. Um, if you leave them under for too long, you may end up with rot. Talking about the heating mat, I've never even used one. And as I'm thinking about going into winter, I was definitely thinking that, because I'm doing this in my garage. Um, and in the past, I've tried it in a unheated spare room. And so for people who haven't used a heating mat before, do you always need to use one, whether it's 80 degrees out in your propagation station or what should we do? Uh, if you use it when it's too hot, it can add too much heat. And then it'll, it'll prematurely uh, brown off or yellow off those, those plants and they will die on you. Um, so don't use a heating mat when it's too hot. Only a small portion of my roses are actually grown on a heating mat, but in the shoulder season like this, when it's getting cooler outside, the temperatures are a bit lower in my propagation area. I find that the ones that I'm placing on the heating mat are showing a significant improvement over the ones that aren't. I think that we're all gonna be looking for something to keep us busy during the winter and we're gonna be trying our hand at propagating. So space heaters would be good. And then can we be successful in an unheated area that's going down to 40 or 50 if we are using the domes, using our heaters, and then maybe covering the area with, you know, a sheet. I'm thinking, I keep not on a rack. So I'm thinking to keep that temperature in um, that I could just cover it with a sheet. Depends on where, where you propagate actually makes a bit of difference. And not everybody has the same options this way. Um, during the main growing season, I, when I'm doing indoor propagation, I propagate in my downstairs room, which is cooler than the rest of the house. And that's a good thing because if you're in summer temperatures and it's building up, you don't really want um, super high temperatures for your propagation. You'd rather have an air temperature on the lower end, you know, sort of like that 70 degree, you know, for the air temperature. If you're getting into the winter and you have some options around it, you either have to, you have to consider either heating the area you're working with or changing the area. So during the, during the winter, oftentimes I've pulled my propagation upstairs into the main portion of the house. Where we're maintaining temperatures more in the more in the right range, the more right the base range, and then I just do it in the in 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 a better environment. But if you're if you're talking about doing it in the same like garage area uh, where you've been doing it during the summer, um, then you may have to heat up the whole area. But again, heating for the whole area isn't as important. If you're if you're doing the heating mat, a differential between the root temperature, the soil temperature, and the rooting temperature, between that and the air temperature is beneficial. It's actually nice to have a cooler air temperature around the plants, but a warmer root zone temperature. It, that differential encourages the growth to be focused at the roots rather than the shooting. Um, let's see. All right, last thing as we're thinking about preparation, to sway the odds in our favor, we're going to be looking for a cutting that it has just bloomed because all of the energy um, that it needs uh, to be able to be cut and propagated is going to be in that semi-hardwood cutting is that correct? Uh, there's a there's a heavy flow of energy and nutrients heading up that stem as it's in active growth, uh, whether it's before bloom or whether it's during bloom or whether it's just after bloom, isn't as important in my thinking as what is the firmness of the stem, the firmness of the stem, uh, and the development stage of the. Uh, remaining buds, the, the, the buds that are just below or are on that stem, but there's sometimes a bud with, where the leaf comes out, sometimes the bud underneath that is really, really flat and green. And that means that it's not ready to shoot. Sometimes they are red and elongated, and you can tell that means they're going to go directly into a brand new shoot in that spot. You're looking for something in between. You know, you don't want something that's completely flat. Um, ideally, you can go with something that's completely flat, but it will take a little bit longer. Uh, you, you'd like the sequence to be, uh, you take the cutting, within three weeks, two to three weeks, you've got callus, you've got initial roots. And in that same period of time, that bud that we're talking about at the top, the top bud in that cutting uh, should be thinking about starting to shoot.
And somewhere ideally between three and five weeks after the cutting is done, when the rooting is finished, it's sending a new shoot with new leaves and you're in good shape. If you choose it when it's very, very flat, that will lengthen that time. It, it may not send uh, the new shoot until a little bit later. If you do it when that is elongated and it's too large or too developed, what you probably will end up with is it shooting before it roots. And I think that's the that's a failure mode. I think that's most likely to end with your with your rows not not being propagated. Okay, so now that we have our supplies, we know what we're going to get ready when we want to propagate. We're thinking about going out into the garden now. And so we're setting up our table with everything that we need. We're wetting that soil now, right? Are you running the hose through it and then squeezing out all the extra water? How do you determine that soil medium, uh, the moisture, what it should have before we put that cutting in it? Usually um, it's, it's like uh, if you were baking a cake and you add the wet ingredients and you add the dry ingredients, uh, or uh, probably you're adding the wet ingredients to the dry ingredients, and then you're looking for that right texture that, that makes the dough. Uh, that's what you're doing with the soil as well. So if you got, my recommendation would be that bale of, uh, of peat moss and perlite mix, it comes to you dry, right? right. And then you, then you add in, you, you, you add in a generous dose of moisture and you leave it for 15 minutes then you come back and you spin it around you see what it looks like and boy it's still dry in the center of that bale it's still like it's you know so you add a little bit more and then when it gets to the point where you can feel the moisture in the soil but it's not to the point where you pull it and you you feel moisture drip out of it right you don't want to get to that stage where it's a where it's a wet sponge where you can shake it squeeze it and it comes out you want to get only to that stage where you've just incorporated Incorporated enough water to make it uh, to make it moist enough to do the job. Well, excellent. My friend Vanessa did a video on mixing that up, and it was shocking. You're right that you come back 15 minutes later. Here you think you've mixed it really well, and you've stirred it, and you come back 15 minutes later, and it's completely dry in the center. So I'll put that up here for everyone to see uh, what's involved in that. Right. And then does it matter how close you're cutting to the bottom of that node? Yeah, it matters. It actually, that one matters a fair bit is, is my experience. Uh, Ralph Moore, who is the breeder of miniature roses out in California, did a bunch of propagation experiments. And one of them he did was when I cut just exactly as close to the node as I can get, or whether I leave a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch. And he said, even at an eighth of an inch, even at a quarter inch underneath that node, it made a big difference to the success rate of his cuttings. So you want to try to get it you know, as close by eye as you can to where that node is, because that node is where all of the undifferentiated tissue or stem cell tissue or whatever you want to call it lives, the parenchyma tissue. Um, so that's that's where it's the, uh, the the most receptive to forming callus and roots. In your experience, does it matter if that cut is straight or at an angle or any, <laughs> any variation of that? Uh, not in any way that I've been able to tell. And you know, I, I'm I, I. What I love about this hobby is that I can be I could be convinced otherwise. Uh, I'm working with somebody who I'm trying to train how to propagate things, and he likes the slanted cut. Okay, well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, let him do that, and I'm gonna see if his results because we we are using the same methods in the same environment, and if his results are consistently better than mine, then uh, I will stand corrected. Well, let us know because I think that if you're talking about getting as close to that node as possible, it would make sense then to keep it flat versus at an angle. Right, unless you, your angle goes from the opposite end, the other side of the of the cutting. If it goes, uh, if you were to go a little higher on that side and then aim towards the bottom edge of the butt on the other side, uh, that's the method that uh, that my friend has been using and, and you know, we'll see. I've seen when I'm watching your videos that you really vary between whether you're leaving two leaves or one leaf on each side. And so does it matter? And you also, you cut leaves in half before. And I'm sure mm -hmm. some of it is just judgment calls. Can you tell us how you make that call of what you're gonna leave? Right, leave okay, so when, when I did this one, and you can see in this one here, this finished one, I've got two, two plants in here. I took two cuttings and put them in the same pot. Um, that density that you're putting them in together will determine uh, how many leaves you leave on uh, to a certain degree. Uh, because you want to leave enough space that the leaves aren't stacking on top of each other. And, and so you want to have each one of them have their own individual space in that tray. Uh, uh, tight is fine. And I think in general, I, I even have better success with a little more tight. And also because it's a numbers game, 
You know, if, if I can fit 36 cuttings into a tray, uh, that increases my odds over placing just uh, 18 in that tray. You know, and I know you're talking about focusing this on home, home propagation. Um, for me, it is a numbers game. You know, I, I, I want to be successful and I want to be successful with more than just one rose. You know, so I pack them in tight and I've built most of my lengths and my, my firmness of those stems and the amount of leaves I leave on. Uh, I've built it for volume a little bit. Uh, you could be a little more relaxed about it and say, oh, well, I got, I got lots of room, you know, I got lots of, you know, and that's, and that's fine too. Uh, but, you know, the only thing I can say about my method and the only thing I'll give advice on is that my method works for me. Make no mistake about it. We all want to be propagating at the level that you are. <laughs> Uh, so you're not scoring and you're not removing thorns, right? Uh, okay, so there are certain roses that have a ton of thorns, um, you know, rugosas, spinocissimas, um, that, uh, that it would be hard even to get good stem contact with the soil. Uh, you know, I'm thinking scarlet moss. It's like, it's just wicked thorny at the base. So you actually have to go on there and rub off the uh the thorns dip it in your rooting hormone and stick it in just so you can have decent contact between the soil and the bottom of the stem where you've applied the rooting hormone um but that's the only exception i really make i don't score anything because i i'm of a, a mixed mind on scoring and injuring the, the the cuttings is that i took that cutting very precisely because i wanted it i wanted the tissue at the bottom of the stem uh, and the minimum amount of tissue at the bottom of the stem to, ha to have that rooting hormone on it and, and be exposed to uh, injury. Uh, if you injure more space, you do create the possibility that it could root from different places along there. And, and I've thought about that. Um, but you also increase the chance that it could get attacked by fungal organisms. So you've increased the surface area for both things. So you don't get the advantage of one without the disadvantage of the other. And because it involves an additional labor step or work step, I'm thinking, well, you know, why would I choose if I'm, if I'm unsure that one is better than the other, then why would I choose to do the one that is more work? Let's talk about the seasons. Does that affect uh, propagating? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a bit like uh, there's a prime time for the growth uh, and even hormonally in the rows um, where it's really thinking about vegetative growth and it's really thinking generatively. And so that time of year uh, in northern temperate climates like ours might be in May or June or July at the peak. And you know when your garden is doing that. Um, if you have a, a, a milder climate or a more extended season, you can continue doing it. And I, I do, I continue doing it. But the prime time is when your roses are thinking about growing. That's when your roses are easiest to propagate. And when you get into this time of year in, in my area where it's cooling down, you're getting cooler nights, uh, the, the roses have had it a little bit, I've stopped fertilizing, um, you know, then at that point you get a little bit less, it's a little bit harder to get good results, even if you take it indoors at that point, uh, because this, the roses, I, I'm, I'm trying to give them psychology here, but they're starting to think about going to sleep. And, uh, and, that's, and that puts them in the wrong st state of mind for, 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 for cutting. It is a good state of mind for the next stage of, of propagation or the next method of propagation, which is the hardwood cutting method. And the hardwood cutting method does a little bit better over the winter. But for, uh, so not discouraging anybody from doing it any time of year, but uh, you know, for your best results and even for the best cycle of results, earlier is better. Let's say you get a cutting stuck in June and it takes three to five weeks to root it and you're in July now and it's got lots of new growth and you maybe even have time to pot it up into a larger pot before the end of the year and you over your overwintering becomes a little bit simpler there because it's more established it has some roots it has some growth uh, if you take it now and three to five weeks from now you have a cutting and you're in the middle of October you know uh, and overwintering it becomes a little trickier i think at that point just trying to get the success so um so I, I would i would go earlier in the year if you have that luxury later is great for experimentation so what i just want to share with everybody right now is this amazing chart that jason created and it's linked to his uh, fraser homepage, and this is such valuable information but it goes by uh the stage one you know what to expect when it's unrooted and it walks through what size pot you're using. 
Where's the location? What humidity are you looking at? The heat, water and fertilizing and pruning and so forth, all the way through these stages. And so Jason, I got a couple of questions uh, from my Rosarians over on the Rose Geek side that I was hoping you would answer. Um, so after three to five weeks, when we are expecting to see roots, what is the longest that you have waited for rooting and still been successful? Uh, it can go, it can go really, really long. And I've had things that have sat there you know, lulling around for two, three months, you know, of just not developing roots and it just doesn't seem eager to do it. Um, I think, I think you should cut, I think you should cut your losses. I mean, my experience has been that they never really turn out to be wonderfully uh, productive roses at that point. Um, so I think I would probably cut the, uh, cut it at maybe a, eight weeks. Okay. And just throw throw a, a, a completely random number out there, but I think if if I knew that a rose was just sitting there for eight weeks, I'd be like, yeah, no, something's not right. It's it's not it's not going to be uh, vigorous as, when it comes through the process. Did you say that a rose hasn't grown after? So you've talked about root and shoot. So you've seen that it's rooted. You have every confidence that it's moving along, but there's no growth there. What can we do to pump that success? Can you remind us to get that uh, rose to start? shooting right well the the temp the, i talked about temperature and when you talk about bottom heat bottom heat is meant to push the root growth uh when you stop doing bottom heat and you go into higher light levels and more overall temperature air temperature uh encourages top growth um so reasonable growth i was trying to go through some of your previous videos and grab snapshots um can you show us what to expect uh for a six month growth one year and if you keep them as long as two years, but just what people should expect. I think when you're talking about inside the greenhouse, you know, this example I showed you, this would be something that is rooted and this has been rooted for a couple of months and it will be like this until it goes semi dormant. It's going to come out of the spring with basically this amount of growth on it. I'll put it into a two gallon pot or one gallon pot, two gallon pot. And in that first year, uh, one of the, something I will just give you some insight to is that an own root rose, you know, put into a pot in the first year, if you go to a greenhouse, some of the first things it'll do, it'll do this like sort of horizontal or almost downwards growth. It, it's almost like it's, it's doing something weird there. Um, it almost has to do like, I'm not saying it has to do that, but it's kind of like, don't get discouraged by that. You know, you'll give it a pruning, uh, you'll get it back in shape and uh, it should fill that pot in the first spring. And then I would have no hesitation there if it's rooted to the sides and bottom of the pot to put it out in the landscape, or you can leave it in that pot for one more year. And I would expect it to be in the range of uh, say two to three feet, depending on variety, uh, variety and, and climate and everything else. It, it's so variable. Well, you and I are in similar environments. And I had a, a message from somebody who's in zone five, and they said that their cuttings are successfully rooted, they're four months old, and now they're starting to think about winter. So do you have to, what do you have to do for your um, potted plants that have rooted that you're trying to keep warm for the winter? Are you just using your heating mats? Are you doing anything else special for them? Uh, well, I'm I, probably not in the same problem as everybody else has is I'm a zone eight. Uh, so the closest, uh, we, we don't see anything terribly deep below freezing uh, here for any length of time over the winter. So usually it's fine to just leave them inside my, uh, inside my unheated greenhouse over the winter and don't do anything to it. Uh, occasionally I get a, a kind of a threat of an outflow wind that could take it to much lower temperatures. And in that case, I have at times run in there and grab trays and put them into my garage, which I know will stay above zero. So one of the things you can look at is just saying, where's, where's an unheated location that doesn't freeze that, that I have access to. If you have a garage or an unheated out building, that's a good spot to overwinter roses. If you have one of those really, uh, uh, you know, uh, a more more challenging climate than mine, that's a good place to look for. Okay, because uh, we want them to still go semi dormant during the winter. We don't want to keep um, pumping the heat and and. Um... Not, not unless it's a it's a, a fresh brand new cutting. Like if you if you did it at this time of year, I expect you you know you're in for the long haul that you're going to have to keep this thing in active growth all the way through the winter probably uh but if you did it earlier in the year and you're at you're at this stage already uh you're going to let it go to sleep got it 
Um, at what point when you see roots, do you move them out of the humidity dome to open air? If they've had roots, like if, if I can, if I've confirmed that they're pulling back and they have roots immediately, immediately, you, you want them out of that humidity. I, I, I don't know if, if it, I don't really bother with an intermediate hardening off stage. I usually just put them right onto a bench where they get watered with everything else and then just keep an eye on them and see if, if, if they turn, uh, they're going to, they're going to tell you pretty quickly whether they are truly rooted and doing well or whether they're going to fail on you. Uh, that's one of the stages where you do lose some. When do you decide it's time to pop them up? Are you just waiting to see the roots come down through the current pot size that they're in and say, okay, it's time? Yeah, most typically I'm looking for roots to the side and bottom of whatever container you're using. Like the four inch pot is pretty standard for me, but some people use smaller, some people use larger, but typically you're looking for whatever pot size you've used that it's rooted to the bottom and sides of the pot. With that feeding, once they're early rooted, one, one time a week, you're doing a half strength or a quarter strength of fertilizer. Right. Yeah, and what I'm looking for is also the reaction on the leaves of the rose because they've gone through a period of time here where they've had no access to nutrients pretty much. And, uh, and if you don't start feeding them, you know, at that stage, uh, they, they will, they will actually look pale and, and anemic a little bit. So you start feeding and you're looking to cure that, to cure that problem with them. You're actually looking for a good green leaf color. So you can, you can step it up as soon as you've confirmed that they have roots, you can step it up as rapidly as you need to. But my suggestion is to start at half strength and do it once a week. Well, I'm really happy that you showed this, Jason, because I don't think a lot of people know. I've never heard in my propagation areas, and this is great information. So when you're at stage three and it's three months and it's in an outdoor area, you're fertilizing it two times a week. I think this is great information. It's really gonna help yeah. people. Yeah, it's container culture, which is, you know, I, I just wanna draw the line there because, you know, when you're talking in the garden, if you said to people, you need to fertilize your roses twice a week, you'd be like, are you crazy? You know, like that, that, that's a little excessive, but in a container, if that's your only source of nutrients, uh, then then you manage it and, and you do it by eye and you look for the results in, in the rose. If it starts to look a bit yellow or, or pale, then you know, you need to step it up a little bit. And if it starts to look a little, well, too green, then you know to pull it back a little bit too. All right, so now that we've answered all the questions specific to hardwood cuttings, I just have a couple here to throw at you and you can say yay or nay, whether you know it, or would even consider it. Um, so hydroponic systems or fogging systems, have you seen videos on this? It's very interesting. Yeah, it, it is interesting. It is interesting. I haven't tried it. Uh, I, I, you know, and I think because I'm a kind of a propagation, I, I like this stuff, I'll probably play with it. Uh, but you know, the, the other thing I, I do mine, I, I try to stay with the thing of, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And whatever, <laughs> I knew you were say that, yeah. Yeah. Whatever works the easiest yeah. is probably your best solution. So when I heard people talking about, Oh, I, I think it works great if you put a potato in there and I'm like, what's wrong with your potting soil? Like, <laughs> why, why wouldn't you just use potting soil? Like right. if you're going to have to put the potato in potting soil anyway. Why wouldn't you just use the potting yeah. soil? Um, and it's not putting anybody down. I like that there are people who have that enthusiasm and interest. And if that gets them into the hobby, that's great. Uh, but I don't want them to get bad advice either. And, and, and potato isn't a good idea. So I guess that, that would be like, if this is the 201 class, that's a 301. You've been successful at propagating and you want to try something new, you're bored. Let's try this. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get the banana in there. Like, let's get an <laughs> onion in there. We'll, we'll get some potatoes and, and zucchini and we'll do all sorts of stuff. Well, and so this brings me to, you did a video on your soilless method and I hadn't seen an update. And that was fascinating because you were using these takeaway lunch containers um, and you are misting the inside of a container, like a big Tupperware bin, closing it. And it looked like you were having success, but I didn't see that you took it further. Did it not, were you not successful it, it, to be able to it root? Worked, it worked okay, but it's, it, you know, again, you go back to the simple. If I wasn't able to push my hardwood cutting success rate past 50%, and I wasn't, it, it was about the same. So if, if I couldn't do it better with that method, then why wouldn't I just do it in soil? And that hardwood cuttings are traditionally, you do them in the garden and you do them in a shady place in the garden and you find a spot where they aren't likely to dry out 
and uh, and you just stick them in the garden. And typically, I can get about fifty percent success rate doing it in the garden. So that other method is interesting, and I may return to it just to to play around and and you know initiate callousing and everything else. Uh, but uh, you know uh, that's that's the test for me is just does it make more sense than what I'm already doing? And if it if it doesn't make more sense than what I'm already doing, then there's no point in going further down that that road. I'm curious if it's even possible from a grafting perspective, you know, you've seen those um, advertisements where they take three fruit trees and graft it onto one stem and voila, you have a tree that is providing three different uh, kinds of fruit. Is it possible that you could, if somebody wanted to look into proper grafting a rose, that they could make different branches produce different roses? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, yeah, that absolutely. Was... Yeah, and and I've seen it. I've seen people do that. Really? I've okay. seen I've seen I've seen products where they have two two roses on the same stem. I've seen amateurs do it. Uh, it so I think that's the coolest end of the grafting hobby. The the question of getting a different rootstock onto your rose doesn't get me too excited. It's kind of like, well, I like I like the own root. I like to see how they perform on their own roots. Uh, if they can't perform well on their own roots, I I question the value of even growing the rose. That's that's just my bias on the matter. Um, but that being said, when somebody says to me, oh, I could do something cool, I can get myself like a, a standard, but I can put like you know four roses on the top of it, or I can I can you know I have a an old existing rose and I just I just want one one side of it to grow a different color I'm like cool uh, that that sounds fun so thank you so much I know we have pummeled you with a lot of questions and I really I know that you're helping me and I'm sure that you're going to help a lot of other people so for the rosarians that um, have additional questions feel free to comment down below or as you're watching Jason's other videos that I'm going to link to with that complete guide Jason, I'm sure you would be willing to answer those questions for everybody. You bet. And just as a as a point of of uh, you know, people reach out to me all the time. But one way that they reach out to me often is on Facebook or Instagram or uh, email. I don't know how they get my email address, but they do um, somewhere. It's it's posted somewhere, I think. Uh, and those are not the best ways to get a hold of me uh, in terms of these kinds of questions. Go to the topic, go to the video that has the topic or an adjacent topic to the question you want to ask and put it in the comments there. I prioritize those because um, my thinking is that if I answer the question there or start a discussion there, that there's more chance for other people in the public to contribute their thoughts on it and that there might be other people who want to and want answers to a similar question. Right. So if people are searching through those comments, I prioritize that much more. And I just don't have enough time to get to everything that comes in by email or get in uh, from Facebook or, or Instagram. So uh, it really is on the comments of the video that I that I focus my social media efforts. Thank you so much, Jason, for it was my pleasure. Us today, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.